timing hey everybody <laughs> i thought i had another second to cough uh, <laughs> welcome to the true crime squad this is katie weaver i'm here with my sister co-host and partner in crime christy brower hello hello hey everybody how's Happy it going monday it's really good it's going great wonderful i got botox today oh, for my nice. migraines and it appears that i did not get surprise eyebrows this time Last time I got, I got, I get Botox every three months and yeah. last time I got it and it just depends every once in a while, if they get a little too close to the muscles in the top of my eyebrows, then I get this surprised eyebrow thing where my eyebrows are like this all the time. And <laughs> it happened last time. And the reason I know it happened is because we spend so much time looking at ourselves on video, yeah. recording our shows. And I was just teasing my doctor about it um, and about how I could tell, you know, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't put my eyebrows down. And yeah, anyway, he fixed it. So I don't think it's going to happen this time because <laughs> they don't feel like they want to, you know, I can put them up, but then they go back normally. So. You're not even anyway. feeling surprised. Okay. I'm not <laughs> feeling surprised. And if you've ever wondered why I have a lovely smooth forehead, it is because I have chronic migraines and I get Botox every three months. <laughs> I mean, it's not the worst gig in town. <laughs> I mean, it works. Also yeah. lose the forehead. So whatever. Right. We'll take what we can get. I mean, who cares yeah. about the forehead wrinkles, truly? But uh, the migraines. It's they not got something it I've ever been concerned about, but now I really don't even have to, even if I wanted to be. Yeah. Because I don't get them. Well, okay then. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, I am still COVID coughing. Someday. Oh, no. Someday I'll stop. I, right? Right? <laughs> That's the hope. That is the hope. But uh, otherwise, yeah, all is well. We took it really nice drive this afternoon it is so beautiful right oh, now my god idaho in the fall is just such a magical place it is so beautiful yeah we've been out gathering uh juniper berries to make oh, gin yes. and i had bought scott a new still for his birthday because his last still was not the right one for gin and also was kind of not it and well, it guys get this. she wants gin so what did she do? She gave her husband a still for his birthday <laughs> to make her gin. She oh. has got this gifting thing down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be real, he wanted one. He actually ordered it. But <laughs> I just think like, hey, what do I want my wife to do for me? And I'll buy it for her for her birthday. Right. Okay. You got to figure <laughs> this out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so we've been gathering juniper berries up in the mountains and it's just absolutely gorgeous. and. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. So now we just got to get some, uh, it's potato harvest season here in Idaho. And mm -hmm. so I want to buy some fresh potatoes from a local farmer to make our mash out of, to make our, the alcohol, to make the gin. Anyway, it's mm -hmm. a long process, but I'm trying to do it all local gin. That's really and cool. I hope it's not just cough syrup by the time it's done, you mm -hmm. know, but I, I'm trying to use all local products and I think we'll be able to do it uh, entirely. So that is very cool. I, I yeah. think we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. But we have got a lot today uh, per normal, right? Mm -hmm. There were so many things we could have done today. And here we are. So we could have done three episodes today and still been, I feel like rock back on our heels, but I guess we just had to pick an all Idaho show. We did. Yeah, we really did. So I'm going to kick it over to you for our first uh, segment, which is a true crime news update. Well, the family of J.J. Vallow, this is J.J. You may remember he is the youngest murder victim of uh, Lori Vallow, his mother and alleged murderer, uh, Chad Daybell his body has been released to his family so that they may actually hold a funeral and bury him and do whatever they're going to do with his remains. Uh, he was found buried on Chad Daybell's property in Fremont County, Idaho on June 9th of 2020. 
Uh, he had already been missing for nine months at that time. So this has been going on for a very long time. He, he has been gone actually for four years. And his his grandparents and other members of his family have been impatiently awaiting, frustrated with the courts, um, awaiting for his body to be released so that they can lay him to rest. You know, they need the closure of that. So um, the interesting part of it is that his sister, Tylee, who was also found at the, on the same day, and was missing for the same amount of time, her body has not been released by the courts. They are maintaining it. So the way that we are, where we're at right now, is that Lori Vallow has been convicted of their murders, as well as the murder of Tammy Daybell, Chad Daybell's wife. Uh, she was convicted in May and um, just sentenced last month. Yeah. And uh, now we are in the process of the buildup to the second trial for the co-defendant, Chad Daybell. Uh -huh. So there have been a lot of questions all along. Were they going to hang on to the children's bodies throughout both trials? Right. Nobody really knew. And, I, you know, I completely understand the frustration for the family. Oh, man. Yeah. It's awful to not be able to lay your loved one to rest. But at the same time, we want to be 100% sure that they have all the evidence that they need in order to convict these monsters. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. And in some cases, like in uh, Kohlberger, or Kohlberger. Kohlberger. Kohlberger, thank you. I wanted to say Colbert really bad. <laughs> Kohlberger. Moscow murders. In the Moscow murders, those kids' bodies were released almost immediately. And I yeah. could not believe it. Uh, this seems better in some ways. I Right. For, as far as the evidence is concerned, I it seemed strangely fast in the Moscow yeah. murders. The for thing sure. I think that we have to remember is that, that there was a huge difference in the condition of JJ's body and Tylee's body. JJ was found intact, wrapped in duct tape and plastic and plastic. Tylee's body was dismembered and destroyed, burned. Um, during Lori's trial, there was a lot of emphasis made on the tool marks mm -hmm. on Tylee's pelvis, particularly. And so the evidence is quite different between the two. We still do not even know a cause of death for Tylee and probably never will because of right. the state of her body when she was found. But at this point, the state must feel that they need to maintain custody of her remains because something else may be used. We just, we're not sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, lots of love for um, their brother, Colby, for Tylee's aunt, Annie Cushing, and all of the other family members who are awaiting being able to put Tylee to rest as well. Mm -hmm. Because th no matter how you slice it, this is tough and painful. Oh, it's terrible. And yeah. it, it's great news uh, for JJ. And I will be really glad when we can say that it's also great news for Tylee. But for Absolutely. now, that is where it's at. So we'll keep you updated yeah. on that. We do think if they were going to release them both, that they would have released them in the same order, like the same order from the court would have released both bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, it did not. So it does appear that the state is is going to hang on to Tylee for a while longer. Mm -hmm. So we'll, sh we'll see. That may be until after Chad's trial is over. We're just not sure at this point. Yeah. And with that, Katie, I'm going to send it back to you for our main case. Okay. We're talking about Thomas Creech. You may remember and you may not. We did a story about Thomas Creech about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. He is someone who has the unique uh, claim to fame of being sentenced uh, to death twice. And uh, in Idaho, he's also Idaho's longest serving death uh, penalty or inmate in Idaho in the prison system. Mm -hmm. And last week, there was uh, his death warrant was signed and he is scheduled to be executed on November 8th. Mm -hmm. This is such a multifaceted story, and I'm going to try and do it justice uh, in one episode. Uh, but 
some of the big questions here for us, of course, have been, do they really have the drugs? Because if you remember, it wasn't that long ago that they were trying to put another man to death here in Idaho who is terminally ill. And they signed his death warrant anyway. This was Gerald Pizzuto, of course. And mm -hmm. they fought and fought and fought to be able to execute Pizzuto, who also has been on death row for about 40 years. Mm -hmm. And Not that much shorter of a time. No. And they signed the death warrant anyway. And then, uh, as it turned out, they didn't even have the meds to do it. They've done it like three times in the last few mm -hmm. years. And then yeah. it, the date has come and gone. Yeah. Then they simply don't have the drugs. And we know that this is happening across the country. Uh, drug companies don't want their drugs to be used for executions. And so right. there also was a big scandal in Idaho that was revealed somewhere around 2019 that in order to execute Paul Ezra Rhodes and another inmate sometime around 2011, 2012, 2012 is the last time we have executed anyone here in Idaho, mm -hmm. that those drugs were procured in illegal ways. Uh, and very suspicious, weird ways. Both of them were like backyard deals. Essentially, the warden found uh, compounding pharmacies uh, once in Utah and once in Washington where he could pay cash for those drugs to be mixed up for him. Uh, in one case, he flew by private charter to Washington, met a compounding pharmacist in a Walmart parking lot late at night, gave him a briefcase with $25,000 cash in it, and he gave him the, the drugs. So sketchy. Yeah. This is supposed to be a public official. Mm-hmm. And the Utah uh, deal was something similar to that, but the Washington we knew a little more about due to, uh, I believe it was Idaho, was it Idaho State Journal? I think it was. I think so. I, I would like to give props to whoever busted that. I think it was them. Uh, but because that story broke, Idaho's prison system said, we don't think the public should get to know what we're using for executions. Wow, we don't think that the press should get to pry into these things and report to the public what we are using for executions, which a lot of people are going to argue is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, it, I think it's a violation of the Eighth Amendment. But uh, yeah, we are paying for those drugs as Idaho taxpayers. Mm -hmm. We have every right to know. Yeah, the the aversion to transparency in this state is staggering and we're seeing more of it as people start figuring these oh, yeah. things out mm -hmm. you know you think about all of the refusals to have cameras in the courtrooms and some of the big trials we've had recently and that are and that are coming up idaho's legal system does not like scrutiny nope and that's they a huge problem like because visibility. they work for us yeah yeah we so should what came get to from that of these things absolutely and what came from that is that our state legislature, being the good little lemmings that they are, hurried and passed a bill making it illegal for those things to be made public to the or to the public, for the public to know. So now it's not legal for us to know what's being used to execute. Super wrong, problematic. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Mm -hmm. So the state says we got the meats, right? They're saying they've got the drugs. They are ready to roll with Creech. Why Creech? Why now? Who the hell knows? I don't know. I mean, he's literally been in prison my entire life. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a oh, no. Why not history not? Yeah, of Creech, of his history. Thomas Creech has actually made claims of killing over 40 people. Now, he's not been convicted of that by any stretch. He's been convicted of killing three people. He's one of those that loves to confess. Mm -hmm. But the murders that put him in prison in the first place in Idaho, and he had already sat for a murder in Arizona and was found not guilty interestingly, 
uh, before this, when he was 23, I believe when he was 27, he was found guilty of murdering two men in Idaho. Uh, he, two men, he was with his wife at the time. Two men had asked for a ride. I, I think they were house painters. And supposedly he uh, shot and killed them both and then partially buried them in shallow graves. And then, of course, uh, he did eventually get arrested for that. And after he was arrested, he started confessing to all of these different crimes. And it really depends on who you talk to and what article you look at. And there's even been, he's been included in multiple books as well about whether or not he committed any or all. Uh, there, it sounds like authorities are pretty well convinced that he did commit at least seven of the murders that he has uh, said that he did. So there was an interview with Judge Durchie before he died. Judge Durchie is the one who sentenced him in the first place. Mm -hmm. Judge Jerchie said it was verified that they did find some of the bodies that he identified before them and showed them where they was. That was his defense in my case. He said, my goodness, I'm admitting, I'm admitting I killed all of these other people. I wouldn't deny this if I had done it. It's interesting because the murders of the two men he has always claimed innocence for, but instead taking credit for a whole bunch of other things. The Idaho Supreme Court said, Creech has admitted to killing or participating in the killing of at least 26 people. The bodies of 11 of his victims were shot, stabbed, beaten, or strangled, have been recovered in seven states. He wasn't charged for any of them. The former Ada County prosecutor, Jim Harris, said they found a large number of skeletons that Tom led them to in a mine shaft in California. So he was connected to all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And supposedly was connected to the Hells Angels and that, uh, and in fact, when he was uh, tried for the first two murders back in uh, 1976, he, they actually moved that clear to Wallace, Idaho, because they were so worried mm -hmm. that the Hells Angels were going to show up and cause trouble. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. So in 1976, Judge Durchie found Creech guilty of the two initial murders and sentenced him to hang. Well, at that time, Idaho's uh, law was a first-degree murder sentence was a mandatory death sentence. Or sorry, a first-degree murder conviction was a mandatory death sentence. Wow. Uh, yeah. I did not realize that we'd had mandatory. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. In 1979... In that law was found unconstitutional by the Idaho Supreme Court and yeah. Creech was commuted to life in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jim Harris said, he was the prosecutor, he said, in our opinion, Creech was psychotic and he didn't like inmates and he would probably kill someone if they didn't supervise him very closely around other inmates. It was a short time after that that Creech was allowed trustee status and given full run of several sections of maximum security uh, parts of the prison as a janitor. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there for a minute with his history and, and go back to present day what's happening now. So his attorneys have filed now uh, for a hearing to commute his sentence again. Mm -hmm. And what they're, saying, clemency, right? mm -hmm. what they're saying is that he is, I mean, he's 73 years old. He, they're saying he is a, he's no threat to the community. This is Creech, by the way. Oh, maybe. Uh, at any rate, he's 73 years old and he, you know, has been in prison now since the mid seventies. And they're saying that he is a stand up guy now. And Come that on. he is a mentor to younger men and helps get them through the prison system and back uh, on the straight and narrow. They say that he is a 
that it would adversely affect the mental health of the jail, or sorry, of the prison employees, because uh, they have worked with Creech their entire careers. Uh, they say that he is tremendously sorry for his crimes and has shown a lot of remorse. I don't know about that. I haven't seen that remorse, but I probably wouldn't have, so I don't know. Uh, Judge Durchy also had said before he passed that he sees no need for Creech to be executed, that killing him would just be an act of vengeance. I mean, that's what all death penalty is. Mm -hmm. The last time he had any kind of negative action towards him in the jail was in the mid 90s. Mm -hmm. Since then, he has been on exemplary uh, inmate. And that's that's what his uh, team is arguing, that there's no sense in putting him to death at this point. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. So there's all of that. There are some groups that are working really hard uh, to, there's there's some petitions going around, you know, anti-death penalty groups are working hard to uh, try to, uh, you know, support the commutation. You can write a letter. There's a lot of things you can do if you want to support that action. Um, people are weird, man. On Twitter, oh, some people are just... Um, they just like death. They, you know, but yeah. But so all of those things being said, and I believe that quite a lot of that is true about Creech, that he is rehabilitated, that he's not really a threat to society now, and that he has done a lot of good since he's been in prison or has done a lot of good for younger men in prison. There's a lot of inmates that will say that about him. But I want to tell you a little bit about the last victim. Yeah. The reason he got the death penalty for the second time after the first was commuted. I want to tell you about David Dale Jensen. David Jensen was from Pocatello, Idaho. He was a young man. He was in prison for uh, a theft charge. He was not there for a super long time. We're talking about less than 10 years. Um, he had a few years left on his sentence. In 1981, he and Creech got into a scuffle. Apparently, Creech was a janitor, and he said that David Dale Jensen was messy and always making messes that he had to clean up, and he was pissed off about it. And they got into it about that. Now, remember... Creech had trustee status, meaning that he was allowed to be alone with other prisoners. Right. David Dale Jensen had been released from his cell for an hour to shower and exercise. And that's when this happened. They had a fight. And David Jensen had a sock full of batteries but I believe that that was actually provided to him by Creech. Uh, it appeared that he had goaded him into a fight so that he could fight him. Here's the Ooh, thing. Okay. David Jensen had attempted suicide when he was a little younger and had actually removed part of his skull in that uh, action. So he had a plastic oh plate in his head. Because of that, he was also cognitively disabled. Um, I will hold to the opinion that David Jensen didn't belong in prison. Uh, he didn't belong yeah. around people like David Creech. Or sorry, mm. uh, around Thomas Creech at all. Right. And he walked with quite a limp. He had some cognitive issues. He had some speaking issues. Uh, he shouldn't have been there. Yeah. But mm. he was. And so they had a fight. Creech took the sock full of batteries and he beat David to death with it. He beat him oh God. about his head and face so hard that it shattered the plate in his head. Oh, God. The guards, when they actually found Jensen, said that there was an enormous splattering and pool of blood from what oh. Creech had done. He, he beat him to the ground with the batteries and then kicked him in the head and face over and over. It sounds like... Uh, Knowing, Jen probably, that he had that vulnerability. I'm sure he did. It sounds like his head was kind of misshapen as well. 
God. But this guy's rehabilitated, way, right? After, after yeah. he's done something like that. This is David Jensen. This was a kid. He was a yeah. dad. He was an uncle. He was a brother. This kid had had a hell of a hard life. Yeah. I want to tell you a little bit about his upbringing. He, his parents were divorced and his mom commits suicide and he mm. found her. Mm. Well, overdose, suicide, something along those lines. And mm -hmm. he and his sister found her. And when that happened, he was 18. He and his siblings had to move to Pocatello and live with their bio dad, who was horribly abusive as long as well as stepmom. And so mm -hmm. he moved out to get away from that uh, and had a really rough go of it. And eventually tried to take his own life, wasn't successful. Then later on, I believe he stole a car is why he was mm -hmm. in prison. But, okay. but David Jensen was not a violent criminal. He mm -hmm. was terribly disabled to the degree that he didn't belong where he was at all. Mm -hmm. And Thomas Creech capitalized on that. He found the one person in that prison that would probably be the easiest to overpower and to beat. And he beat him to death with his bare hands mm -hmm. and feet. And it's horrifying. Yeah. I, I have to say that when I read the brief from Creech's attorneys, I was like, I'm not usually a big fan of the death penalty. They're right. They should commute this. This is ridiculous. But then I remembered David Jensen and I went back to his story, read up on it. We actually had some contact with his family and revisited that. And I went, what do they want? What do they yeah. want? And, and that should matter, I think, in this instance, uh, to some degree. And for one thing, I, I want to send all of our love to them because talk about constantly re-victimizing this family as this has marched through the courts and been so many ups and downs over the years. There have been several other orders for this execution that haven't gone through. This has been a lifetime for this family of Thomas freaking Creech. And I can't imagine mm -hmm. that they're not so damn sick of him and all of this that they don't even know what to do with themselves. So while right. you're thinking about Thomas Creech and whether we will or we won't actually execute him this time, don't forget David Jensen's family because sure. they are still living this and they will Absolutely. always. So will it happen on November 8th? Will it not? We don't know. Idaho says they have the drugs. I don't know if I believe they've them. said that before. Sure they say. said that with Gerald Pizzuto when it turned out they to not did. be true. Mm -hmm. Now, Idaho did just pass a new order to carry out executions via firing squad. And they're saying if we can't use lethal injection, we'll use firing squad. Well, that's super problematic and can't possibly be true, in my opinion, because they have yet to build a facility to carry out firing squad uh, executions. Yeah, and apparently that's, you can't just, you don't just take someone out and shoot them. Like, there's a whole thing they would have to, a huge bu a building and all this stuff they would have to build to actually make that a possibility. And that has not occurred because that yeah. law got passed with no input from the Department of Corrections. Yeah. And so, yeah, right. Yeah, right, Idaho. Yeah, right. Yeah. We're not sure what to think about all of this, uh, especially because now it's all so very secretive. You know, we're not really right. allowed to know. Why should the taxpayers get to know what's happening with their own damn money, huh? I, apparently. And honestly, if we're going to have capital crime, then by God, it needs to be as transparent as humanly possible. Because we right. also have an obligation to make sure that the laws are being followed in our states. And Absolutely. Idaho is always tiptoeing around the sides of Eighth Amendment violations when it comes to prisons and prisoners. So Idaho is constantly being sued for violating people's human rights and laws that have been passed in Idaho being found to be unconstitutional. Look it up. It happens all the time. It's yep. pretty much all our legislature does. It's pretty much all mm -hmm. our attorney general does. Yep. is end up in court over these things. So mm -hmm. yeah, I have lots of doubts. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there you are. 
I, I knew I was going to take you on an emotional roller coaster today with this, uh, right. with this case, because it is one. There's certainly both sides to it. And again, I'm on team Jensen. I, I'm on whatever the Jensen family wants and is at peace with at this point, because mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it doesn't matter for Creech. He's been in prison his nearly his entire adult life. He is 73 years old. He's not going anywhere. I don't know that executing him is any good use of Idaho's time and money. But again, on the flip side, there is still a family living with the horror of what he did. So it's hard to judge that. Uh, and, and I don't have the right to. I know that for sure. Mm -hmm. So there is all of that. Uh, yeah. It opened up an interesting conversation. There was a story uh, on the Marshall Projects website about how many terminally ill and very aged inmates there are in the United States right now because so many states have really not been exercising the death penalty for the last 20 or 30 years uh right with the exception of Oklahoma, Texas, uh Florida. I mean there's a few that have been put needles in arms right and left, but there's a lot of states that haven't like Idaho. A lot of botched um executions in out of those states too. Yeah. Yeah. And that how many of them that uh, our prison systems are turning into assisted livings and mm -hmm. how many of them are requiring uh, advanced levels of care, of course, because they're getting to be elderly, mm -hmm. uh, need to have all kinds of uh, assistance. And many of them, when they, if they do finally sign a death warrant, uh, many of them are getting commutations because of their advanced age and because of their health issues that make them really not candidates for the death penalty. Um, like Gerald Pizzuto. I mean, like there's a Gerald whole bunch Pizzuto. of reasons why he is mm -hmm. not a good candidate for lethal injection. Mm -hmm. There was actually a couple of attempts at the death penalty not too long ago, uh, here in the last couple of years, where the death penalty, the, the date came, they tried to do the execution and absolutely could not get veins and had to abort the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Not in Idaho, not in Idaho, but others. There's also been a question about dementia. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court has now ruled, I believe in 2018, that people cannot be executed if they don't understand why. Meaning, if you are in Alzheimer's or dementia, and you don't even know your own name or what you're in prison for, they cannot execute you. And that has happened. That that now uh, we've seen some commutations based on that rule now. Makes you wonder if these... that's why they're trying to move forward in Idaho on Creech and Pizzuto, because they're still cognitively able to understand? Yeah. I mean, after sitting in death row for so long, it does make you wonder, like, why now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It, it is interesting. Um, if you guys remember a couple of years ago, there was a man who had committed a murder in Chalice, Idaho, a good 50, yes. more than that, 60 some years ago, and mm -hmm. had fled and just happened to be found living in Texas mm -hmm. and was extradited back to Idaho and was completely crazy he was in his 80s and yeah. he was uh he what they weren't even able to try him at all because mm -hmm. he couldn't participate and he lived in one of the state mental hospitals until he died last year yeah but, and they, they never even tried him no mm -hmm. it, it's becoming a really interesting conversation around all of these elderly people that have sat on death row for this long there's also mm -hmm. been multiple uh, suits filed uh, alleging that leaving somebody on death row for these 20, 30, 40 years is also a violation of the Eighth Amendment because living mm. every day, knowing that you're on death row and that a uh, death warrant could be signed at any time, is cruel and unusual punishment. It's an interesting concept. It is an interesting concept. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's a big conversation. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a conversation that I think every state needs to be having and that people need to realize this stuff is happening. If it's happening here in your state as a death penalty state, it's happening in your state too, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, it certainly is. Yeah. Yep. This is, uh, this is going on everywhere. These exact conversations. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't have any answers for it, but I, I think it's, these are conversations that need to be had. I think that we all should be paying attention to capital punishment in our states. Um, some of you guys that live in other countries that don't have capital punishment, I know you look at this stuff with abject horror, you know? <laughs> and, right. And I get that. I get that. I'll, I'll say honestly, my own opinion of the death penalty has been challenged many times as a true crimer. Mm -hmm. uh, and again today, because I went into looking, taking a fresh look at this case going, this is dumb. Why are we doing this? But then I looked back at David Jensen and at his death and the just total unfairness and ugliness of what happened to him. And then I go, but is there justice? Is there justice right. for David? I don't know, guys. Discuss amongst but yourselves. is murdering a murderer the way that we deal with this as is a civilized society, either? too? I mean, I'm anti-death penalty. The man's been in um, prison for 45 years. Yeah. More, anyway, close to 50 years. And no. I'm a anti-death penalty, too. But I, I can't get the families out of my mind, either. You know? Right. And, and what they're... But then... As the family, do you want the weight of the responsibility of deciding if there's someone gets executed or not based on what you think or how you feel? Because no. then there's that. That's a lot of weight to put on people, too. I'm not sure that that's fair. There shouldn't be. But on that same token, why has this family had to wait for this day for 40 years? Why? Right. Yeah. Why in the hell has this taken this long? They also could have had their suffering minimalized. 20, 30 years ago. Or you, had we not had the death penalty, then they would have just known he would spend his whole life in yeah. prison. But yeah, just to be so up in the air now um, for, you Any, know, for all this time, yeah. the not knowing is the worst part. Absolutely. Anyway you anybody. slice it, this is just stupid and it needs to be different. I agree. I agree. I know it's multifaceted. I know that... Uh, you guys as listeners all have different thoughts and feelings on all of this, and I absolutely honor all of them. And if you want to discuss in the chat room, please do. Uh, or in our comments, that's what they're here for, of course. Uh, yeah, so so there you go. That's what's up. So we'll be keeping a close eye on this. Will he get that hearing? We don't know. Will it make any difference at all? Or is Idaho really jumping back on the wagon? We don't know. We'll find out soon, I'm sure. Yeah, well, we will. Yep. Well, Christy, with that, I'm going to pass the mic back over to you for one more true crime update. Yes. So a small update in someone adjacent to the Daybell Vallow case. You probably remember Lori Vallow's niece. Her name was Melanie Boudreau. It is now Melanie Pulowski. Melanie Pulowski is yet again... Uh, to be appearing in court in Arizona, this is in Mesa, for a computer tampering charge. Now, mm -hmm. this charge was dropped against her at one point and then refiled. Mm -hmm. it, it has to do with her divorce from Brandon Boudreaux. Now, as you recall, if you follow this case, Brandon Boudreaux had an attempt on his life. And yeah. that attempt um, is being considered, it's possible that Lori Vallow will actually be charged uh, and, and, well, will be tried for conspiracy to commit attempted murder of mm -hmm. Brandon Boudreaux. He was shot at, uh, the window was shot out of his car. It is yeah. believed that her brother, Alex Cox, was the person who did the shooting. Of course, Alex is dead. Um, but you, you remember that whole story. Yeah. So Melanie Pulowski will be in court on October 19th to face what is a charge of computer tampering. Mm -hmm. Around the time that all of this was going down with Lori Vallow and Chad Nabel and the attempt on um, Brandon Boudreaux's life, the marriage between Melanie and Brandon 
had dissolved. And Brandon had to go on the run for a while with their children, was hiding out at his parents' house in Utah with them because he was terrified that they were going to kill their kids too. Yeah. And um, and he might not have been wrong. Right. Right. He, he may not have been wrong. So what we know now is that Melanie logged into a bank account, a Chase bank account, that was under the name Cougar, Cougar Consulting, and that was the name of Brandon Boudreaux's business. She was supposed to have her name off that bank account. At, uh, she had 60 days after the um, finalizing of their divorce decree to have her name off from that account. Uh-huh. Uh, so that was um, October 3rd of 2019. So Mm -hmm. then the account was accessed by her sometime after March 2nd of 2020. So she should have been off the account, shouldn't have, should not have had access to that account at all at that point. No. So in November 2021, a um, detective with the Mesa PD talked with, and you're going to remember this name, Melanie's attorney, Garrett Smith. Remember Garrett? (laughs) Yeah. Garrett, who um, Brandon Boudreaux won a huge defamation lawsuit against. $12 million lawsuit. $12 million lawsuit for saying some really terrible, inflammatory, and untrue things about Brandon Boudreaux. Um, In this conversation, Garrett Smith admitted to the detective that Melanie had, in fact, accessed the bank account. Uh Um, after she had been removed from it by logging into it online. The problem with that is that Brandon Boudreaux never changed the login information for that account. Uh Now, that didn't mean that Melanie should be able to log into it, but this is what her attorney said. Uh Garrett told me it's not Melanie's fault that Brandon was dumb and did not change the login information until three days after Melanie accessed the online account. Oh, dear God. Uh, yeah. So apparently what Smith told the police is that Melanie believed that Brandon owed her money from a $12,000 check that had been deposited into that account. She logged into the account to get an image of the $12,000 check to give to her attorney. Mm -hmm. So this is a class three felony. Um, It was dismissed originally and has now been refiled. And now she is going back to court on this particular incident. So, you know, we've all been waiting for Melanie Boudreaux Pulowski to get some comeuppance for her involvement in this case and for her involvement in potentially the deaths of Tylee and JJ, because some of the testimony in Lori's, uh, uh, um, trial was pretty damning. Also, Melanie was supposed to testify and ran and refused. <coughs> Broke the rules. Broke the rules. Broke the rules. Ran. Defied her subpoena. Did not face any um, criminal uh, consequences for that. Nope. And now this is still all we have. He, she did have a charge in Utah for trespassing at Brandon Bordeaux's parents' house when she was trying to find her kids when he was hiding them from her as well. But um, this is the only other thing pending against her that we are aware of. So yeah. we shall see. I, I, We're not exactly sure why this was refiled or where this is going to go. But hey, could it be a little comeuppance for Melanie and her involvement in this whole disaster? Maybe that would be all right. Well, that's what I'm thinking is that Arizona wants their pound of flesh here. Well, I think that they do, and I they're struggling to be able to charge her. But the communications between her and Lori and her and Chad and oh. her and Alex are terrifying. And frankly, Brandon Boudreaux probably did save his children's lives when he hit them yeah. in Utah. And his own. Yeah, well, and his, his own. Just I mean, because they failed one. Himself. Right. I mean, they failed to kill Tammy a time or two before they finally got the job done. They weren't done right. trying to kill Brandon either. No, they weren't. I I agree. I agree. So we're glad Brandon's okay. And we're glad Melanie is going to finally face something. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. All righty. Well, this is Monday. 
We will be back on Tuesday with a brand new episode. We'll be back on Wednesday with a brand new episode. Mm -hmm. We'll be back Wednesday night with case updates. And if that isn't all enough, it is also the cold read party this week. Yes. So if you are a subscriber on YouTube, that means that you've joined our membership. It's $4.99 a month. We do a fun event the third Wednesday night of every month called the cold read part or not. It's not the cold read party anymore. It's a watch no, party. Where am it's I? It's a watch party. It's a watch <laughs> party. Similar to what we did with the Murdaugh murders over the weekend on Lifetime. Uh, we'll let you know tomorrow what mm -hmm. the, uh, it'll be a documentary that's around an hour to an hour and a half long on Netflix. So yep. it'll be something that hopefully you guys have. And again, we'll just, uh, We'll all watch it together on our own devices because, of course, we can't stream it because that would be illegal. But right. So we'll all watch it on our own devices and we'll hang out in the chat room together and chat about it. So mm -hmm. we'll let you know tomorrow what that is. But uh, it's a jam-packed week here at the True Crime yes. Squad. We've got a lot yes, going on. Ah. Well, guys, thank you so very much for being here. This has been yet another production of the True Crime Squad. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank <music> you.